Well, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it is good to see you all here. I mean that. I mean that. Well, as Jack said, we are back in our series on judges, sticks, stones, and jawbones. And I want to start with a question. Okay, Here, here's the question. Why don't you think about this? Um, is it possible to have a sincere faith that would become toxic? Okay, can you have a sincere faith? Because sometimes we think about faith as just, just really being sincere before God. Can, can that lead you on a series of steps that might end up in something unhealthy or toxic? That's what we're going to look at here this morning. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of the direct TV commercial. Have you seen the direct TV commercials here uh, lately? Where there's some guy who does some innocuous thing, you know, like he gets, he's just frustrated because he has cable TV and he won't get direct TV. And so, you know, he bangs on the table and then his daughter repeats it and then she repeats it at school, gets kicked out of school. And you know, what I'm you know the one I'm talking about? Have you all seen this? Okay. I love these commercials. They're, they're, they're great, you know? And so, you know, and, and the narrator tells us, and when your daughter gets kicked out of school, she hangs out with undesirables. And when she hangs out with undesirables, she ties the knot with an undesirable. And then, then the last scene, you know, this, this poor, innocuous, innocent guy sitting there holding his grandchild, you know, you end up with a baby with, you know, a dog collar. And, and he's got his grandson who's wearing nothing but a diaper, a leather vest, and a dog collar, right? And the moral of the story is, you know, get direct TV or, or you'll have a grandson that wears a dog collar. That's the moral of the story. Well, the moral of my sermon this morning is don't end up with a toxic faith, okay? And that it can start sometimes in a very innocuous way with some, gent or with some uh, genuine, sincere faith uh, that, goes, uh, that goes terribly bad. And let me say this. A sincere faith is very admirable. That's a good quality. We, we want sincerity. Uh, but it's not enough. It's not enough. And so we're going to be looking at the story of Jephthah in the Old Testament. So if you want, you can uh, turn in your Bibles to, uh, I was going to say Genesis, actually turn to Judges. Judges chapter 11 is where we're going to pick up the story. And while you're turning there, let me give you some background on the story. Uh, this takes place in a land uh, called Gilead, and it's on the eastern side of the Jordan River. I think we have a map up here of uh, this area. It uh, takes place uh, because there's the clan of Gilead that became a very famous uh, clan. This goes some uh, 250 years into the time of the judges, and it was started by a guy named Gilead, and then like hundreds and hundreds of years later, there's another leader by the name of Gilead. The clan of Gilead weren't terribly uh, creative uh, people, uh, just <laughs> like George Foreman's son, Gilead, George, 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 and here it's Gilead, 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 Gilead. Um, so Gilead uh, ends up taking control of, of this uh, whole area, does very well with it, has a number of sons, and one of his sons he names Jephthah. Okay, and Jephthah is different than most of his other brothers in that he's born of a different woman. Uh, Jephthah's mom was a prostitute, but Gilead raises him as a part of the family, and uh, they're all in this on the in the same house, like Bonanza or something. All these brothers in the same ranch house do very well. Then one day Gilead dies, and it comes time to divide up his estate, but. What do you think happens when it comes time to divide up his estate? All the other brothers get together and they say, you know, I don't think there's enough to go around. In fact, I think one of the brothers shouldn't get a share of the estate. And so they say to Jephthah, you know, you're, you're the son of a different mother, a prostitute. You don't get any of this. You don't get any of this. And this is where we pick up the story. So uh, flip with me over to Judges chapter 11. Oh, there we go. Do you have the map real quick? Throw that map up there. Okay, there's, that's a map of Israel in ancient times. And you see Ephraim, and then up uh, to the northeast, you see Gilead. And so this is where all of this uh, kind of uh, takes place. So keep that in your mind. We'll go back to that map uh, here in a moment. But um, look at uh, chapter 11, verse 3. Here's what happens. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob. Stop there for just a moment. Um, he flees from his brothers. Why does he flee from his brothers? 
because he's in danger, okay? This isn't just a, you know, we're going to send our lawyer over to talk with your lawyer, and I'm uh, sorry, brother, but you don't, you, know, you don't get your share. This is, they're running him off. He flees because he believes he's in danger for his life, okay? That's how serious uh, this was. It reminds me of the... Uh, there's a great scene in the movie A Few Good Men where Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson are there in the courtroom talking, and Tom Cruise asks him about this one guy. Was he in danger? Is, of course he was in danger. Was he in grave danger? Is there any other kind of danger? Remember that? <laughs> Worked on that real hard, Billy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Later tonight in the chapel, I'll be doing John Wayne and Clint Eastwood in the field. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyhow, anyhow. So in this question, is Jephthah in danger? Yes. Is he in grave danger? Yes. Is there any other kind of danger? Yeah, he's in grave danger. So he flees to the land of Tob. And if you remember the map, Tob was kind of up north. And Tob was in kind of the badlands. It was in, the, in, in no man's land because it sat in these borderlands. It sat uh, to the north of Gilead. Ammon kind of wrapped around and it was between Ammon. And then there was another land called Perea. And Tob kind of sat where all of those came together and no one really had jurisdiction in that area. You could kind of just have your own way. It was kind of like the wild, wild west a hundred years ago around here. You could kind of do what you want. So uh, he flees to the land of Tob. Look back at uh, verse 3, the second half, where a group of adventurers gathered around him and followed him. A group of adventurers. This is a, this is a polite way of saying land pirates, okay? This is, these are ruffians. These are tough guys. These are guys that knew how to use a sword. Um, they probably didn't shower often enough. They, they, these were tough guys. And what's interesting here about what the narrator is doing, it's so creative, the way he's beginning to really give us some deep insight into the person Jephthah here. He is a leader. He knows how to lead and pull people together. And he pulls this this group of characters, these ruffians together, and these adventurers, and they begin to follow him. And it's interesting what it does here when it says adventurers. Earlier in another story that occurs uh, soon before the story of Jephthah is the story of Abimelech. Abimelech is a terrible character. He, he ends up murdering all but one of the sons of Gideon murders them in a single day on a single stone. It is a total bloodbath. Abimelech is this despicable character, but he was a great leader. And the book of Judges, the narrator says, and he brought around him a group of reckless adventurers. And there's this connotation that Abimelech, he's a great leader, but the way he leads these uh, this group of adventurers, these ruffians, is that he brings out their worst. They're reckless. They abuse people. They abuse their power and abilities. But there's this subtle notion that Jephthah doesn't do that. He takes this group of men who are rough around the edges, but he doesn't lead them in a reckless way. He's a little bit more responsible with them. And what's more, we find in the story, as Jephthah pulls this band of warriors. These are men who know how to fight. You know what he doesn't do? He doesn't take revenge on his brothers. And friends, in the book of Judges, that's an amazing thing because revenge is the name of the game in the book of Judges. Blood is shed quickly and easily in the name of revenge uh, through these several hundred years, probably uh, 400 years or so during the time of Judges. But Jephthah doesn't do that, and he could have. And what we begin to see in the story of Jephthah here uh, is a guy who has some character. He has some character. Uh, he is a brilliant man, and he goes through and he gathers up uh, all of these uh, guys. And, and we see with him that even when he's uh, hiding away up in Tob, he has this sincerity to, toward God. He has a sincere faith. What God says in his life matters to him. He wants to follow God. And the book of Judges begins to show us a really very noble character here. But here's what you have to know. Uh, oftentimes, 
This is a story that is avoided in sermons. It drives scholars and preachers nuts in here. And we're going to see why uh, here in a little bit. But the thing you have to know is that Jephthah is a man who has some real character. And then he gets his moment in the text here. In fact, I'm not going to read it here, but let me just uh, kind of fill it in. What happens is the Philistines begin to attack out of the west. And the Ammonites begin to attack out of the east. And the Ammonites actually go up, they conquer all of Gilead. They don't actually go up into Tob, but they conquer Gilead. They cross the Jordan River and begin to attack Ephraim. And uh, the Ammonites begin to dominate the entire region, okay? They, they, uh, they take control. So all of a sudden, here's Jephthah up in Tob, and he's got his own little army. What do you think happens at this point? Well, uh, pick up the story here. Look at uh, verse 4. Look at chapter 11, verse 4. Here's what happens. Sometime later, when the Ammonites made war on Israel, the elders of Gilead, stop there for just a second, who would the elders of Gilead be? His brothers. <laughs> yeah, this, you got to picture this. This is his brothers now. They've kicked him out, and now, now they come to him. Uh, verse 5 again. The elders of Gilead went to Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites, or the Ammonites. Jephthah said to them, and you can just imagine the conversation that ensues now. Jephthah said to them, Did you, uh, did, didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? Well, duh, because you have an army. <laughs> that's, that's why they're coming to you right now, right? Of course they do. Um, he knows what's uh, going on here. Uh, verse 8, the elders of Gilead said to him, uh, nevertheless, never the, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, that whole thing about driving you out of the home and all, I know, but that, 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 was, that was up before. Okay, okay, right? Just, okay, yeah. Nevertheless, nevertheless, we're turning to you now, little brother, right? We're, we're coming to you now. We're being nice. Come with us to fight the Ammonites. And, and you, now this is important, and you will be our head. We'll make you the boss, little brother. We'll, we'll give you... We'll make you king. We'll give you control. We'll make you the top dog over all who live in Gilead. Now, you got to see what's uh, going on uh, here. Here's Jephthah. And what the author has very skillfully done at this point has showed us that Jephthah is a man with a sincere faith. He is a man who's not taken revenge when he's had the opportunity. Um, we're not going to get into this, but if you read the story on your own, you could argue, I believe he is the brightest judge of all the judges in the book of Judges. He shows a kind of brilliance in this verbal debate that he has with the king of the Ammonites that just shows he is, he's brilliant. He's a great leader. He has this sincere faith. He has so much going for him, but he is also deeply flawed. And that's one of the reasons why I think this is such a good story. Um, there have been many a scholar that just wish God would have left this story out of the Bible, okay? And we'll see why here in a little bit. But I'm glad he didn't. Because what we see here is a man of such brilliance, such leadership, he's skilled, has great ability, has a sincere faith, but he's flawed. And you know who that reminds me of? Me. And you. That's the human condition. Right? God has created us to be such unique, wonderful, beautiful creatures. But we're also deeply flawed. That's just part of being human. Uh, and so uh, that begins uh, to come out here. Uh, that we begin to see this, the flaw in his soul. And it comes out in verse 9. And here's what you have to know. To really understand what's happening in this story about Jephthah, you have to understand the turning point, the hinge point in the story. And that occurs right here in verse 9. And if you can understand what's happening in verse 9 then you can understand what's happening in this entire uh, story. So look with me at verse uh, 9. So here Jephthah answers. He goes through this whole thing with his, with his brothers here. Verse 9, Jephthah answered, Suppose you take me back. Now just pause right there. That's the point. Suppose you take me back. What an odd thing to say here. When he says, suppose you take me back, what does he mean there? He means... Suppose you make me a brother again. Suppose you accept me. 
Suppose you let me live at home again and be one of, your, one of the brothers again. See, friends, this is not what they've offered. They've said, we'll make you the boss. We'll make you the king of Gilead. They never said, we will accept you back. They never said, we'll make you our brother again. You know, they, there's no invitation here to family reunions. You know, you're not going to be uh, unwrapping president, presents at Hanukkah with us here on this deal. That's not what's being said. But that's what Jephthah is desiring in his heart. Okay? Big, big difference. Now, what this reveals here is what I'm going to call is the shadow in his soul. There's a deep insecurity here in Jephthah. Will you accept me back as a brother? And at first you want to go, dude, you hold all the cards. You've got the army. They've, they've been whooped. They're, they're coming to you groveling. And yet somehow you're worried. Here's his worry. He's worried that he won't really be accepted back. This is, this is kind of his shadow side playing out here uh, in this moment. Our shadow side, and here's the deal. We all have a shadow side. It is this, our shadow side are the insecurities that split our soul. Some deep insecurity that we all have deep in our soul that begins to play out in our lives even when we're unaware of that shadow side, that insecurity playing out in our souls. And that's exactly what's happening with Jephthah here in this moment. Let me give you some modern day examples of what this uh, might be. It's the guy that somewhere early in his life believed to be a valuable person. He must win and succeed. And that insecurity down there of whether or not he wins or succeeds begins to play out constantly in his life. And he achieves. He becomes an adult, gets into his a career, and he achieves and achieves and achieves and achieves. And all of his friends, all of his coworkers look at this guy and they say, he is an incredible success. What an incredible, successful achiever. Yet, he never experiences himself as an achiever. Because there's this driving insecurity that he's attached his achievements to him being a valuable person. So everywhere he goes, he must endlessly achieve to try and be valuable. It's the woman who believes that in some way or another, she's dependent on other people uh, for her security, to make it in this world, to be loved. And so she has this split off in her soul where she, she feels like she can't take care of herself, whether it's financial needs, whether it's love, whether it's value, whatever it is. And so she views every relationship she has through this lens that she, she can't depend on herself. And so when she marries, she marries someone that she thinks can take care of her. Her kids, her kids are there in some way or another to build her up as a mom. Every friendship she has, she views through the lens of, can this person rescue me? Can this person take care of me? And she wonders why she goes through multiple marriages, why her relationships with her kids are dysfunctional. Because she doesn't know that she's capable in and of herself of taking care of herself. And so she lives out every relationship in a, in a dependent, in an unhealthy, flawed, dependent way. And it's her shadow self that plays that out again and again and again. Will they rescue me? Will they bring me joy? It is the man... Uh, who wants control, that somewhere in his life, uh, he just fears this thing of, if I don't have control, then bad things happen. I need to be in control at work. I need to be in control in my marriage. I need to have control of my kids. I need to have control in the neighborhood. And so he may be friendly. He may be nice. But for him, there's this shadow self that fears, that is so insecure, if ever he would lose control over the things that matter to him in his life. And so without realizing it, he becomes the happy, smiling bully in every relationship because he needs to have control over his spouse, his kids. He tries to manipulate his boss, powers up on his employees. He can do it with a smile, but in reality, his shadow self is driving him to have control. And that's Jephthah. Jephthah has this shadow side, I'll do whatever it takes to be accepted as a brother again. 
Can I be real personal just for a moment and just share a shadow side in me for just a moment? Uh, you know, several years ago, uh, Roger and I switched uh, kind of roles and he handed this baton of becoming the senior pastor on to me. And without realizing it, I had this shadow side of me that, that went into operation somehow that I felt like I needed to live up to Roger, that I needed to prove something in filling his shoes, that I needed to prove that to you and to him and to others. And you know what? Roger never asked me to fill his shoes. You all have never asked me to live up to him. But there was a shadow side in me that thought I needed to, that I needed to play that out. Can you imagine how that would lead me in making decisions if this kind of unknown shadows deep down in my, in my soul driving me in ways? It's unhealthy. It becomes toxic. See, I need what I have been called to do is to lead this church as Glenn Bartow, as the person God has called me to be. Not as Roger, not as somebody else. Not living up to other people's expectations. And the truth is, we all have a shadow side that wants to drive us, pulls us in different directions. And what we end up doing is trying to use our faith to meet the needs of our shadow side. And that's what Jephthah's gonna do. See. A toxic faith is the misguided attempt to solicit God's power in meeting the desires of our shadow. What we're wanting is we're wanting God to change our outside circumstances so that that shadow self begins to feel good. Oh, God, please give me control. Things are getting crazy at work. God, just if you'll do this or that, God, then I'll have control at work. Oh, God, just give me, the, give me that husband that'll make me happy, that'll take care of me. Oh, God, give me the husband that, you know, and then I won't have any financial needs. You know, oh, God, help me win at this. Help me win at this. Help me succeed just at this. I just got to make this one deal in that way. And what we want is we want a faith where we just, I'll be so super, super faithful with you, God, and will you please take care of that outside circumstance that troubles me so much that my shadow side feels so insecure about. But here's the truth, friends. Real faith is about trusting God to face our deepest fears, to become all God has created us to be. See, real faith Real faith is about the transformation of my soul, not the changing of my outer circumstances. Real faith is facing those moments of fear in a way that I trust in God that he changes me, not just my circumstances. Now, is it okay to pray for God to help you in your marriage? Yes. Is it okay to pray for God to help you succeed at work? Yes. Is, those are fine things to pray for, okay? Okay. And pray for them sincerely. But ultimately, a life of faith with God is going to be more about transforming your soul than it is changing your circumstances uh, in life. But here's Jephthah, and he's playing out this deep, deep insecurity. Can I be loved as a brother? Will I be accepted? And he begins to play this out in the story. So uh, he goes off, and you can read this on your own sometime. He goes off uh, to war, gets his guys, uh, takes charge of whatever warriors Gilead uh, had at that moment, goes off, begins to drive them out. And then comes uh, this kind of dark moment where he now begins to act on that shadow self in a way that really does become a very toxic. Look with me at uh, verse 30. Jump all the way over to verse 30. So we've gone through this. There's the battles that have gone on. He's pushing them off. And now verse uh, 30 says this, and Jephthah made a vow. So he hasn't finished the battle yet. There's a lot of fighting to go. And he makes this strange kind of vow. It says, and Jephthah, uh, and Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands... Whatever comes out the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's. And I, now this is nuts, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. 
Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, God, if you'll just give me victory, if you'll just give me victory, because what's driving him at this moment? I just want to be accepted back as a brother. Just, I just want to be a brother again. I just want to live in my house. I, just, I want my brothers to love me. And I think if I just get this victory, I'll get that. So God, I'll do anything to get that. In fact, I'll make this vow to you. If you let me have victory, then when I get back, whatever walks out of the front door of my house, I'll give to you as a burnt offering very stupid vow to make, okay? Now, I'm sure he had in mind the family cat or something. He just thought the cat's going to go, if you're a cat lover, maybe it was a dog, okay? It just walking out, it just, you know, maybe it was something else. We don't know. Anyhow, I'm sure he had something in mind, but he's driven to make this vow. And the reason he makes this vow, I mean, picture this. This is an extreme vow. What is this about? He's trying to act super spiritual. This is sincerity gone really bad. But to him, you know, oh, I'm going to make this vow. And he would have made this vow public. He would have told his men. He would have told his brothers. And part of this is about making him seem super, super spiritual. Oh, man, look how spiritual I am uh, in this moment. I'll do anything, anything. And so he makes this vow. He makes this vow. Um, then finishes the battle, and he completely routes the Ammonites. I mean, he takes complete control of the entire area, subdues them. Uh, all the land goes back uh, to the Israelites. It becomes this great thing until, look at verse 34. Look at verse 34. When Jephthah returned home to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of tambourines? She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. Oh, all of a sudden, he has made a vow uh, uh, to make whatever walks out the door a burnt offering, and it's his daughter. And he is in great anguish uh, at this moment. And it all goes back to this crazy vow that he makes. And that's why people are like, what? I don't know what to do with this crazy story because Jephthah in some ways is this great guy. He has this deeply sincere faith. Jephthah is even mentioned in the book of Hebrews as a man of great faith. But he murders his daughter. And so what do you do with that? Well, what you have to understand is you can be a wonderful person with a sincere faith and still be deeply flawed and have a faith that turns toxic. And that's exactly what's happened here with Jephthah. So what I want to walk through, I want to walk through four things about a toxic faith here that kind of come uh, out of this story because I don't want us to have a toxic faith. So uh, four things uh, here. The first one is this. Toxic faith leads to deal-making with God, right? And this is where we play this out. Oh, God, if you just take care of this at work, you know, if you just get me a new boss, I hate my boss. If you just get me a new boss, I'll, I'll, I'll give all my money to missionaries someplace really awful, okay? And we make some crazy deal. Or maybe you get in over your head financially and you're just like, oh, God, if you just deliver me from this, just get me out of this mess, then I'll, then I'll go on the missionary field and do whatever. And we start making these weird deals with God. Uh, and you know what? That's toxic. God never asked Jephthah to make any deals. In fact, what's really interesting here is in the story, it says that, that the Spirit of God comes on Jephthah. God's already said, Jephthah, you're the guy. I want to deliver the Israelites, and you're the guy, and I want to do it through you. Jephthah didn't need to make a deal to make it happen. And here's the deal, friends. You can simply ask God for whatever is heavy on your heart. If there's something going on, don't make a deal with God. Just ask God. God loves it when his children come to him and say, I'm scared, I'm worried, I need your help, God. Now, be ready for this, though. Sometimes, sometimes God will answer your prayer exactly the way you want it to be answered. Sometimes the cancer goes away. Sometimes you find the perfect job. Sometimes that issue in your marriage works out. And sometimes it doesn't. Because ultimately God's desire for you and me isn't to change our circumstances so that we don't have to change to be happy and joy-filled. Sometimes God leaves our circumstances and changes us. But we don't need to make deals. 
And when we begin making deals, we become toxic uh, in our faith. And we go in weird directions and we do strange things uh, like Jeff uh, uh, did here in this moment. Second thing, toxic faith leads to an obsessive devotion to the religious life. Uh, it be, when we become toxic in our faith, uh, we... There's lots of drama, okay? We become obsessive. We become extreme. Uh, weird things begin to happen. Look, at, look down at verse 35, and you see this with Jephthah. Look at verse 35. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh, my daughter. And you feel the drama here. Oh, my daughter, you have made me miserable. You made me miserable. No, she didn't. He made himself miserable. But, oh, the drunk, because I've got this great vow. He's spiritualizing this whole whole thing. And that's what toxic faith does. We end up spiritualizing everything. Look at this. You have made me miserable and I am wretched because I have made a vow to the Lord and I cannot break it. Oh, look how spir I'm not going to break this vow because I'm so spiritual. No, he should have broken that vow the second he saw her walk out there. He should have said, not the cat. It's my daughter. I guess I'm going to break the vow. That's what he should have done. Okay. But he keeps it. Why? Because he's trying to act spiritually, becomes extreme, and there's this kind of crazy drama that goes with it. And we've all, right, we've all experienced this with people. We've had people come on, oh, I prayed to God, and he told me to wear the brown socks today, and so I'm just following the Lord. It's like, what? <laughs> That's just stupid, you know? I don't think God cares what color socks you wear today, you know? Yeah, my car, my car broke down, but praise the Lord, because that's just, you know, what's supposed to happen. What? I'm supposed to just say, God, I need help with my car. It's just, this is miserable and I don't like it. And it's just, and they spiritualize everything. Like everything that happens in their life is just exactly the way God wanted it to be because I'm so spiritual. And I just, oh, uh, this is just tragedy in my life. But, uh, but praise the Lord. I just, and you're just like, man, get a grip, okay? But right, okay, you're laughing, but right, you're laughing because you've seen it, okay? <laughs> It gets toxic, and it's not good. But you know what? When people do that, are they sincere? Yeah, usually they are. But that's what sincere, uh, sincere toxic faith does. And he uh, plays this out. One time I had a guy stand up on the lunch table at work. When I was working in construction, I worked a graveyard shift for a while. So we had lunch at like 2 in the morning. And one, there was another guy that was a Christian on our uh, work team. I don't know what got into him, but all of a sudden, he started uh, preaching to us. And the next thing I know, he's standing up, and we're at this metal table. We're all eating lunch for 30 minutes. He stands up and starts preaching to us and telling us all about this stuff. Next thing I know, he's standing on a chair looking down at us. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, Lord, get us out of this. This is just, you know. And then he puts one foot up on the table. By the time he ended, he had one foot up on the table, one on the chair. He looked like Captain Morgan from the commercial. I just I thought it didn't <laughs> Any, no, it was way worse than that. Anyhow, and I'm just thinking, and I'm watching these guys, and I'm thinking, these guys, this is so toxic. They're never going to want to go to church ever again, ever in their life. We're freaking them out right now on this thing. But that's what toxic faith does. It becomes dramatic. It becomes obsessive. And, and, and it's never healthy. But it always makes the person living that out feel very, very uh, spiritual. Because toxic faith is all about making us feel spiritual. Third thing, uh, toxic faith leads to uh, faith formulas or to a formulaic uh, faith, kind of A plus uh, B equals whatever. Uh, you see this like in the prosperity movement. Okay, if I pray this way and I read my Bible so many times and then I get into this mental state where I just picture myself being wealthy before God, then God has to make me wealthy, right? Or if I stop taking the medicine and I pray and read my Bible for so many hours a day, then God will, will heal me on this thing. And we start coming up with these funny formulas for what God must do if we do A plus B or whatever, then God will do this. Well, you know what? That's putting God in a box, God never does well in boxes, friends, okay? As in, he never stays in boxes that we think we've put him in. But there's something about toxic faith that wants us to put together this formula. And that's Jephthah to some degree. He says, okay, if I make this vow and then I go into battle, then God will automatically de deliver us. No, that's not the way uh, that works. And Jephthah thinks that by making this little formulaic promise that he's going to get victory. When in fact, 
And the passage says God was already determined uh, to do that uh, in his life. Uh, fourth thing, toxic faith always hurts others. Look back at verse 36 uh, here. Verse 36 says, uh, my father, uh, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you have promised. Now stop right there. That's sad. He has pulled her into his toxic faith. And now she's going along with this terribly unhealthy thing. And that when toxic faith goes bad, it it hurts other people. It drags them into feeling like, I guess I need to do this to be spiritual, you know? My neighbor friend who's a Christian said, we have to pray for five hours a day and eat food that we don't like because that's really spiritual or something. And just, no. And it goes on, look at this. Uh, it says, uh, do to me just as you have promised, now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites, but grant me this one request, request, she says, give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. Never marry? Who cares about not getting married? You're about to be a burnt offering, okay? What are we thinking? But, oh, I guess, and she's getting dragged into this. And friends, uh, well, read on, verse 38. You may go, he said, and let her, uh, and, and he let her go for two months. She and the girls went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. And again, I'm like, who cares if you're not going to marry? You're going to be a burnt offering, okay? I can't get past this. 39, after, uh, after two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he vowed. And she dies, and she gets hurt. And there's something about toxic faith that is always about controlling others. There's something about toxic faith that always heaps guilt, always puts others down so that we can look more spiritual. Toxic faith. Toxic faith is all about controlling the outer side of things. And that always hurts other people. Let me close with uh, this story here. Um, when I was in college... Angie and I had a very, uh, very good friend, and still do. She's a wonderful person. We have a great uh, friendship with her. And at that time, she was engaged to a guy that he and his family had a very uh, toxic uh, faith, very sincere, loving, wonderful people. But there, there was kind of a high level of toxicity to their faith. And our friend found herself in the hospital. She got really, really sick. They ran some tests and found that she had a small hole in her heart. And that if... She didn't have it repaired. It was going to get worse and worse, and eventually it could uh, kill her. So she is in the hospital, and in a day or two, they're getting her all prepped for this surgery. They're going to go in and fix the hole in her heart. Well, her fiancé's mother showed up at the hospital all by herself, showed up, sat down at her bedside, read her some passages of the Bible, prayed, because you got to do that anytime you do that, right? And then said to her, Sweetheart, the reason you have a hole in your in your heart is because there is sin in your life. And if you will just confess that sin to God and repent of it, then God will heal the hole in your heart and you won't have to have surgery. But if you have this surgery, that's sin because that's wrong. And the only reason you have that hole in your heart is because of the sin. Now, that's toxic. Can you imagine what it did in that relationship? Can you imagine how it made our friend feel? Now, Thankfully, our friend said, hey, this might not be the healthiest family to get married into. And she decided not to. And she has since married someone who's a lot healthier and a much healthier family, a very wonderful thing. The story all turned out well. But I tell you that story because in the end, it was toxic and it hurts. It hurts the cause of Christ. It hurts us because it focuses all of our energy on trying to change our outward circumstances, project a very spiritual image, and what it hinders is the true process of faith that is all about transforming our souls into pushing those shadows away, not living by those shadows anymore, transforming our souls into the kinds of people God really created us to be. So, the moral of the sermon is, don't have a toxic faith, okay? Stand with me for a closing prayer. And uh, we'll be continuing next week in the book of Judges. We're going to be having a great time. Glad to have you all uh, here. Let me pray. 
Father, we come before you and we just, we just thank you for these amazing stories that fill scripture and how uh, they give us such great insight into how we can relate to you and the life that we can have with you that really does transform us into all that you created us to be in the image of your son, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray this. Amen. Have a great, great weekend. See you next Sunday.